okay. they can't see us. Yeah. They prefer it this way. No, that's fine. I've got it all on my um my <gasps> Okay, we're live streaming. Okay, we'll stop now.
Hello everybody, welcome to Deaf Victoria's second monthly advocacy forum. So before we begin, and I'll hold on a moment, I'm just getting a few technical hitches there. Let me just sort that out. Okay, so before we progress, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land where Deaf Victoria stands. Nam here in Nam on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nation. We would like to acknowledge elders, past, present, and the emerging leaders. I would like to also acknowledge deaf elders and leaders who have advocated for our community, culture, and language. Deaf Victoria was founded by leaders who actually volunteered their time and committed themselves to the community, which we are very proud to continue the work of the legacy that they've left for us to continue with. Hi, so my name is Shireen, and I'm one of the facilitators here tonight for the Advocacy Forum. And my position here is Project Coordinator, and I work alongside Catherine Dunn. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight, so I'm here in her stead. We would like to thank very much a, a group of people. One would be the Department of Families of Fairness and Housing, previously known as DAHHS, for their support and funding, which enables us to establish and facilitate these types of events such as we're having tonight. Expression Australia as well, our continued partnership with them and the fact that they allow us and let us use the JML Centre where we are streaming from today. We would also like to thank the NDIA for their support and funding for our projects, which has led to the development of various resources that we will speak about tonight. So as I mentioned, we will speak more about that tonight. I'll hand back to you, Sarah, if I could. So I'm Sarah, I'm one of the facilitators tonight and my role here at Deaf Victoria is the Information and Communications Officer. We're so excited for tonight's advocacy forum, focusing on discussions of information and media accessibility. The advocacy forum is an opportunity for you all to provide input into our work and share resources and sector updates. So Deaf Victoria is totally committed to the community and we want to ensure that our work is transparent and accurately re representative. Over to you, Jerry. So tonight we're focusing on the information and media accessibility and what that actually looks like for the deaf sector and our community. We will discuss various examples and various models ranging from within the deaf sector, deaf sector, online, local, state, and federal levels. We also have guest speakers tonight. We have Shirley Liu, we have Julia Murphy. And we also have Carl Mears from Deaf Australia. So please just make sure you're really comfy and stay tuned tonight. Back to you, Sarah. <clears throat> so we understand information and media accessibility is a huge issue for our sector and our community. Last year alone really highlighted and showed the importance of the information especially through the bushfires and the COVID-19 global pandemic. We've seen a huge surge of awareness about Auslan and our community's access needs with the increase of Auslan interpreters at press conferences and on screen. So looking back, we've come a long way from the 2011 Queensland floods where Auslan interpreters were advocated for phenomenally and with great success. So finally, that advocacy 
Do we think it's finished or come to completion? No, it hasn't. We still need to fight for accessibility. We need to have accessibility to government briefings, updates, the NRS updates may further present, prevent us from accessing information. There's many barriers out there to the communication and media information that comes through, but Cherie will um, expand on that tonight. Tonight we'll be exploring four different types and how we can implement all of these in situations of inaccessibility with media and information. So we're going to start with two areas. The first one is self-advocacy. So this method focuses on how individuals can bring attention to inaccessibility. For example, commenting on social media platforms, requesting captions or as interpreters, and no captions, for example, And Facebook was, we were blocked from Facebook for a while as well. So we need to see interpreters, we need to be able to have captions to access that information. It happens time and time again. So that type of advocacy work can be so tiring, not always effective. So I'm looking forward to later when the forum opens for people here to talk about their experiences and effective self-advocacy. You can also download our self-advocacy toolkit, which is available on our website and also in hard copy. So please contact us. Our email address is info at deafvictoria.org.au and we can send that information through to you. So get yours. Anyway, we'll move on to the second one, which is peer advocacy. And what that means is it's similar to self-advocacy, but with the support of others. So you could have several people, for example, from the community or resources. And a group of people can move forward to help advocate for each other. So now I'd like to introduce our first two presenters, Shirley and Julia, who will be talking about their experiences with self and peer advocacy you may recognise them, their work with Auslan Media Access and the Can You See the Auslan Interpreter, which went viral, advocating for interpreters to be accessible on media and announcements. So over to you, Shirley and Julia. Paul, are you um, voicing? No, you're doing this. Oh, 6.17, you said, okay, right. Yeah, I'll do it. Sorry. Yeah, okay. so this is all about media access. Um, and now, you may recall some time ago in late 2019, um, December, November, December period, the bushfires started. They were phenomenal. There was a lot of coverage on Facebook, a lot of information presented in spoken and written English. Unfortunately, the deaf community didn't have access to information in Auslan. There were news reports, updates. There were no Auslan interpreters provided whatsoever. The deaf community were really frustrated. The bushfires were a significant event and natural disaster. It's a part of the Australian summer, you know, iconic way of life. It's vital information. Right, Julia? It is, surely. 
but we didn't understand a lot of what was going on. We made some noise and rumblings. We asked organizations, uh, do you have Oz interpreters? Are they available? And in time, thankfully, they came to us. But unfortunately, there was another barrier. And that is that different broadcasters, particularly 7, 9 and 10, and sometimes the ABC, uh, ABC perhaps was the best, you know, at, at, in terms of the Australian government, they have certain um, responsibilities that they always provided Aussie interpreters to these types of natural disasters. But it was with the commercial channels, it was hit and miss a lot of the time, right, Julia? And we saw Aussie interpreters being available uh, there, but often the broadcasters cut them out of the picture. And that was really frustrating. Right. Absolutely, it was. I mean, access to information is so vital for us. And I do remember at that time when Shirley contacted me that um, I was on holiday in Wollongong and um, there were fires around and I was keeping a track on you know, what was happening to make sure that we were safe and we would be able to get back home to Melbourne. And Shirley said to me, well, how, you, how about we set up this group? And I said, go for it, let's try. And at that point, we realised that one person can take on that whole responsibility. And Shirley believes you know, strongly in teamwork, collaboration. So I thought, wow, she really was inspirational. And um, so we worked together and uh, we got a whole heap of people joined us, didn't we? Yeah, that's right. And we had a, a joint goal. We wanted access and equity. That's all it was. But it was a vital goal to us. So you're right, Julian, during the summer holiday period, a lot of people you can hear take for granted the information that they access via you know, the radio or television broadcasts. But if you don't have access to it, like we, deaf people, the deaf community, uh, it's just unacceptable. And we're used to it. Everyone uses their phone, right, every day. Mm, absolutely. Day. So imagine taking a big monitor or television to you know, your favorite summer holiday destination or a laptop. You could. But if you're in a remote area or somewhere down on the coast, um, it just doesn't, doesn't work, right? And most of the time, you know, 90% of the time, you've got internet accessibility or capability around the country, unless you're in a really remote area and there is no internet capability there whatsoever, then you've got, you're stuck, right? But most, within most places in Australia, there's that coverage via live, live Facebook streaming, but sometimes the interpreter still wouldn't be there. And that was really frustrating. It really started to you know, build up that frustration, not only within myself, but many other deaf people around Australia. So we started making comments and posts on Facebook and say, look, we just want to remind you to have the interpreter in the picture. We know the interpreter is there. We've asked you before, we continue to remind you. And we just were taking no note of whatsoever. They just were blind to us, what we we're saying. And December, January, the, the frustration was building. Temperature was rising. Yeah, those bushfires became really serious, didn't they? They were. They were becoming more and more serious and severe. And our level of frustration and angst was also increasing. So it's all around the country. Western Australia, I think, was last. But those bushfires are going throughout New South Wales, South Australia, and Queensland. And it wasn't just me, so many other people thought, what can we do? Let's problem solve them. A lot of people have brainstorming. And like you said, Julia, on, Julia earlier on, I'm, I believe in you know, a team. Australia is a big country. There's 25 million people live here. And I don't know, say 40,000 deaf Auslan users across the country. One person can't do that work for the community. So you're right. We decided to set up this Facebook group. We thought, okay, so let's make it simple. Okay, so let's keep it simple. We came up with AMA. Auslan Media Access, right? So we thought, okay, so how can we strategize this, get the word out uh, and engage people, get, get the call, out, call to action out, get people to work with us and support us in our campaign. And what we thought maybe two or 300 people who are motivated, committed to make this happen. We invited lots of different people. Uh, on the day, I remember inviting people, made the announcement, asked for people to, to share and share the likes and people were like, what's all this about? And the word spread quickly, didn't it? Yeah, people just came from everywhere. They really did. They popped up from everywhere. And also, just if we can add in data as well, I mean, that 
um, is so important because there was so much data being used and um, you know we had to make sure people had time when they didn't have time like Shirley said before you know you know there's an interpreter there but um, it's not on screen they they didn't seem to take that into consideration so there's a lot of advocacy going on and um, you know more and more posts going on to these um, Facebook sites and uh, supporting each other the more the better more people that were coming in and and we were creating that awareness as well so the awareness was increasing exponentially so it was brilliant Shirley. Yeah that's right I've got a few more things I know you've got a lot to say too Julia Okay, so uh, we you know, started to put more information up there and we've talked about the importance of data, uh, what times, and we could work out the channels and what was really being shown. And, and most people were saying, you know, the ABC were including the present, like the presenter at the emergency broadcast plus the interpreter. But around the country, most states, ABC were doing it. In Victoria, Channel 9 and 7 and 10 started to include the interpreter in the picture, okay? But New South Wales, no, they didn't. Queensland started to, I think, Channel 7, I was including the interpreter in the picture in the broadcast, but you know, state by state, it was different. You know, it wasn't a national consistent approach. We're thinking, you know, we need to have a policy here. And we were talking about what was happening in Victoria, the interpreter being there on screen in the broadcast. It's not compulsory, okay, but it's highly encouraged. And they were accepting that and in Victoria, but the other states were just taking no heed of that message. I'll talk about that barrier a little later on. Anyway, you know, we started to grow in number and size in our voice. We were 200, 300, 400 people coming in. It was people from the deaf community and the wider community across Australia, our allies, students, interpreters, a whole lot of different people. So a wide cross-section of the community. I think within 24 hours, we had already achieved, I think over 2000 people coming in and supporting our cause, which was brilliant. And we were enthused. So the word was getting out, it was becoming viral. Again, you know, it's a group, it's a team, we're working towards the same common goal. Thinking, okay, how can we more affect it? How can we really make the point known, make it loud and clear about the importance of this? And we came up with an idea of creating a video. And we asked a particular woman and her name is Marnie Carriage. Okay, Marnie, you probably know Marnie. And we asked her to come up with some brainstorming ideas think a short, sharp video, let's get the message out there. We asked people who'd be willing to basically put forward the same message. Do you remember what that was? Do you remember that, Julia? Yes, we need to see the interpreter, show the interpreter, see the interpreter. That's right. Save our lives. Do you remember that? That hashtag as well? That message it was powerful, wasn't it? It was. Bushfires are raging across Australia. And we wanted to show the connection there. Information presented to us in Auslan could help us save our lives, rather than whether we stayed or we left. Stay or go, remember that? That hashtag was powerful. We made videos and they got the message out. Again, that went viral by Facebook and what am I doing? Twitter. You know, they're the two platforms are used. Okay, those audiences are really powerful and valuable to us in our campaign. And it went viral, okay? And it got attention, a lot of attention. Uh, and then people who worked, you know, within the broadcasters, they were being made aware of it. They started to see the groundswell of support within the community, and they got the message. The importance of the Ozan interpreter being in the picture during these emergency broadcasts. Do you agree, Julia? Yes, yeah, so we had better understanding. The camera um, men were able, or camera people were aware of our needs and made sure that they zoomed out so they captured the whole picture. And so all of those, um, and all the activities we need to be able to see. I mean, it's so important that, I mean, you, you mustn't forget that, you know, deaf lives matter as well. You know, it's really important that we understand what's going on. We need access to that information. It's so important. So AMA was um, brilliant in letting people know what decisions were being made and, you know, that sort of a formal decision whether to stay or whether to go. You know, all those decisions in bushfire times can be you know, absolutely detrimental to people's lives even. So access to that information was absolutely pivotal. True. So, you know, we're, I think through February and March, that time period, 
again, a lot of information was going out about bushfires, the Aussie interpreters there, uh, the media, access, interviews. I wanted to know why it was so important to their people. It wasn't just one you know, story, but I'm so pleased we got some good coverage there in the media too. Throughout that time, there were other discussions taking place as well. Now, we had visions that AMA would bring people together, get the support. Okay, then what's next? And we thought, okay, we're going to give an opportunity to educate people, to train people, like Sherry said earlier on, the different types of advocacy, individual advocacy, peer advocacy, right, Julia? Yeah, absolutely. And something, and we believe that both of these are important. You know, you can't have one without the other, okay? They go glove in hand. So we thought, you know, some people don't want to advocate. They don't like advocacy, advocacy, that's fine. But to know what you can do behind the scenes, locally on the ground where you are, provide some information and training. Then another deaf uh, woman by the name of Katrina Lancaster, Mags. Katrina uh, came then involved and said, look, I can help you set this out in terms of making a formal complaint. A lot of people uh, will just vent, you know, on frustration their frustrations on social media and Facebook. That's natural. People go there and vent, okay? And feel, okay, done. I've said what I need to say. But does it really result in any meaningful change or social change or action? No. We need to take that, you know, that venting, okay? And actually put into constructive channels, you know, through formal channels to make that noise and venting frustration heard to result in social change. So we put forward our arguments with data and evidence, okay? And then we made the relevant contacts through the relevant channels, uh, through, for example, an MP, bring it to their attention. Lots of MPs became aware of it. And then the Facebook group, if you have a look, uh, there's so many examples there, post after post, of different advocacy efforts. And the complaints then became valuable because they resulted in social change. Because when something happened similar the next time, we could just use that information okay and put forward a complaint again when it wasn't happening okay it could be the next day a few days later a few weeks uh so what people need to know rather than having that angst okay we had templates there for those also that had maybe problems with english literacy so we took multiple prompts uh to approach to this issue we also had letters and we want to thank julia there for assisting by creating those form letters can you just talk about the importance of those form template letters, Julia? Yeah, as Shirley said, I mean, you know, one person may not be quite sure about how to do something working as a team. You know, there's a deaf person and, um, you know, and all you others out there. I mean, we know English is not necessarily our strong point, but some people are very confident with English. And, um, you know, and it's okay to be confident or not so confident. What's so important is knowing where to start and to know what you're advocating for. And as Shirley said, you know, you can't just be emotional and, and just vent. You need to push that all aside and think specifically about what it is you're requiring. Access, interpreting, and the ability to save lives as well. So Shirley and I had a real discussion about what was the point. Well, to save lives, the risk of people dying through bushfires. And uh, so, you know, we need to be able to access that information and make a huge, you know, point to, you know, who's our audience as well and contact all those people, type up letters, send them out to the powers that be. So we summarised it into point form, this particular document that we sent out and, uh, I'll tell you what happened, of course, with the fires. So that was um, something we were looking at. And what was the issues? The issues were there was a lack of interpreters. So we had no access to the information. Our first language is also, and that was another issue. And then, of course, we get set, told, well, can't you read English? Well, no, we need to let you know that Aussie is our first language and we have the right to access information in our first language. <clears throat> And our preferred means of communication with any um, uh, information that's out there, it needs to be through an interpreter. We have the right to ask for that. And we wanted updates as well. We didn't have access to any of that. So we we're way behind the eight ball when information was going out there to the community. 
And also what was so important was captions as well. But they didn't always put in phone numbers. Um, sometimes the captions were incorrect, way behind as well. So really difficult to follow all of that. We couldn't rely on captions. Having interpreters was the best way for us to access the information immediately, the same time as our hearing peers. So that's the most important piece of information we wanted to pass through was the access to the interpreters. And it's a very stressful situation as well, isn't it? You know, having no access to information, not knowing what to do, where to go, all of that. And, you know, your life is important. So, you know, if you, there's just, it's not just you either that can be affected, it can be your family and all of that. So it's absolutely overwhelming to be in a situation where you're not having the information coming through to you in your first language and being accessible. Once we made those points, they seemed to understand what our needs were. And it was really important to give them solutions to these problems, not just vent and, um, and bombard them with all this information. We wanted to be able to give them solutions. Talk to councils, talk to local people as well and government levels right through the, um, the hierarchy and literally say, please change. And it was urgent. It was an urgent need. Please do not just go through this process without a sense of urgency. And please be open to further discussions. And I think from that, we can use all of that information for the next, I don't know, issue after COVID, after bushfires, but we've actually got all of this ready for the next um, piece of work. That's right. And the next major issue was COVID-19. So we had all the, those template letters, we had all the files ready, everything to go. So people were welcome to take that letter and then customize it. Uh, you'd have to follow like the form letter. There was flexibility there. People could uh, tailor it to their city wants, may ask others their thoughts and then shoot it off, right? All good. And that continued on. That was our strategy there. So it was a valuable strategy, right, Julia? And who would have known that coronavirus was about to hit the world? So we had the natural bushfires, so the natural disasters and the bushfires in Australia, and then the pandemic, coronavirus. Wow. From one point of view, I was pleased to see, you know, those bushfires die down, but then coronavirus hit us. Wow. That's vital, that health information there. And that was an ongoing issue. It wasn't just a day, a week, a month. So we, again, were having to remind the broadcasters all that information we were able to use there, capitalise upon that. That was one of the legacies of the Australian bushfires from that, those natural disasters. So we're really pleased. And who would have known? You know, the, People are still reminding the broadcasters when they forget to include the interpreters in the picture, when they are there on the stage with government officials. So let's just keep reminding if they forget, the MPs, the broadcasters, that make sure those announcements are available in Auslan. And we have to go to the peak advocacy organization for the deaf community, Deaf Australia, okay? If you're not a member, I encourage you to join, okay? Because remember, this is a voluntary group too. They can't do everything. We need to work together as a community, come together for this important cause, our access, information Absolutely. in Auslan. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, please make contact with us. Do you have any ideas, anything that you'd like to help us with? And also just in addition to that, and the letters that we have, um, <clears throat> We must always make the point that we are Auslan users first, but if we don't let them know that that's the language we need to be able to access communication and information, um, then we will be behind, the, be behind the eight ball. That's right. So in summary, we set up AMA, we work together as a community, achieve so much via social media. Anything else to say? Yeah, no, all good, all good. We've achieved so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look, that was excellent. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, Julie. That was brilliant. So fabulous having you both here tonight. And I liked your point where you were talking about accessibility and the fact that, you know, or oh, we should just be passive and, you know, and just get on with our lives. It's so important that we let people know. It's a human rights issue, isn't it? Access to information, it's so vitally important. Sorry, You're Shirley. You're right. You're right, Sarah. Advocacy is not about 
you know, telling people, oh, they should be doing this, but we want to be included just like every other person who's not deaf, okay? That's important. They can't take us for granted. We can't take Absolutely. this for granted. Absolutely. And we have uh, many advocacy organisations and we work together with them and work with you as well. So, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I say I really appreciate the work that people do in the advocacy space. It's so important. And, you know, your information really helps us with our future work in the advocacy space. So thank you, Julia. Thank you, Shirley. That was brilliant. You're welcome. Thank you for your work. So now we'll have um, a Q&A session, okay? So anybody would like to ask any questions, please go for it. And, um, you know, you can ask questions to myself or to Sherry or to Julia or Shirley. So let's see if there's any questions out there. Have we received any questions, Sherry? I haven't seen any yet come through, Sarah. Sarah, do you have any questions? Yes, there is a question that's come through. Go ahead. It's a question for you, Shirley. Hi again. Hi again. So when the video went out and went viral, how did you feel? What was the impact, do you think? Well, for me, I felt proud but at the same time I was elated because it really showed that the community has passion and when we work together we can achieve anything and everything so there are lots of posts you know on social media and I have my own um, Twitter account and I know a few other people have um, a few well-known people out there they're part of my social media network and they're prepared to share and I felt really elated I could see all these allies come together and we're a powerful force to be reckoned with. I was just brimming with pride. I didn't want this to, to stop, okay? I didn't want to lose oxygen within the 24 hour news cycle. I wanted to continue on uh, for not only just today, but for deaf children, the future, future generations. I don't. Oh, I absolutely together. agree. And um, did you have any MPs or ministers contact you and talk about what you'd come to do? I did, it was a really busy time. And one in particular uh, was a senator by the name of uh, Donnie Sharp and contacted them and had a brilliant conversation. Yep, okay, I'll write this article off. And we sent it through to no one else, none other than Prime Minister Scott Morrison. He became aware of the issue and then Albo, that's what he's referred to as, you know, uh, Anthony Albanese, leader of the opposition, he became aware of it that access that was the a vital nexus there okay uh, and it was a central piece of work okay thinking politically acting politically and making contact with mps and then really elevating the issue up through the, the political hierarchy all the way up to the prime minister yes and like you said we, we have to understand both areas of advocacy individual advocacy and self-advocacy it's so important that we're very aware of those two areas of advocacy thank you Shirley. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm just checking to see if there's any other questions that come through. I'll check too. Okay, I think um, I can't see any questions coming through just yet, but we'll certainly put them that on hold for a bit later through the evening. Okay. So now, um, Sherry, perhaps you could talk now about advocacy again, going to the second part of that. Okay. So there are two other types of advocacy I'm going to, we're going to talk about tonight. We've already talked about the self-advocacy you know, and peer advocacy, okay? And the vital role that they play. Shirley and Julia uh, walked us through some interesting uh, information about peer advocacy and self-advocacy and why it's so important on the local level. Now, the two other types of advocacy we're going to cover off tonight are individual advocacy, now, individual advocacy and self-advocacy can be confusing to some people because they look similar, okay, on the outside. But self-advocacy, I define that as a DIY, do-it-yourself type of advocacy. Let's say you've got a problem in your house, you need to have some repairs done, okay? DIY, the repair work, okay? 
You don't need support for that. You do it yourself. Okay, so it's your own advocacy you do in your everyday life. Whereas when you want individual advocacy, you want a support um, a support person to provide that individual advocacy to you. And here at Deaf Victoria, we have an individual advocacy officer, Kate Dunn. You all know Kate, yeah. Catherine Dunn. Kate um, is responsible for our individual advocacy service that we provide here. And if you want advocacy for a particular individual issue, barrier or support, you're most welcome to contact Deaf Victoria at our in info at deafvictoria.org.au email address. Contact us at any time if you want to have a chat about a particular issue or barrier that you're experiencing and you need support or advice. Now, the fourth area that we're going to cover off is systemic advocacy. So what's systemic advocacy all about? In short, it relates to individual advocacy and how so. Deaf Victoria's individual advocacy service gives us an insight, insight into common issues and barriers that people face, such as the provision of Auslan interpreters in hospital settings. This is a recurring issue that we see deaf individuals face across the state. Hospitals not providing interpreters, and it's a common issue, okay? We monitor that, and then we identify that as a systemic issue. Then Deaf Victoria can advocate to the state government to change policy, to improve the service delivery and access the deaf and hard of hearing people in Victoria. Could be improving Auslan interpreter access in hospitals across the state. Some brilliant examples of systemic advocacy here that Deaf Victoria has been involved in the past. Access to captioning in cinemas, do you remember that? Many moons ago. Uh, just recently, we are talking about advocacy or having the Auslan interpreters available during the coronavirus emergency announcements and broadcasts. And another great example, at the national level, it's just recently with Deaf Australia writing the open letter for all the community to see about Facebook's decision to not provide information uh, and news via people's Facebook stream pages and live streams and the impact they had upon us as deaf people relying upon information made av available via Facebook with Auslan interpreting information in Auslan. I now invite Kyle Mears to talk us through um, what they did. Kyle, do you want to share us with us what you did? Hi there. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, and first of all, thank you to Victoria for the invitation. It's an important topic. I just want to share a few things with you. Uh, and you know, advocacy plays an important role in everyone's lives. We enjoy the benefits. And Deaf Australia, like Sherry said earlier on, we wrote an open letter to Scott Morrison. And we talked about Facebook's decision and when the government changed that piece of legislation and that legislation's impacts to us, Facebook, Google and others had to pay, okay, to have news content on their, their, their platforms. And if not, then they would lose access to that. So it came back to the, the issue of not paying for you know, journalism, media content. Facebook made a decision, fine, we'll close, we'll close our business in Australia. We won't provide that. That left us at sixes and sevens. Deaf Australia had two primary goals when this decision was made. One, access to information. And two, access to communication. The two different issues here, information and communication. Access to information is how we receive information in an appropriate form. Access to communication, communication is the how, okay? So I'll provide an example. Aussie interpreters on television in days gone by, remember the bushfires? When that natural disaster happened that summer, like okay, pre-bushfires, the Australian government was looking into this issue with the broadcasters and making changes to the captioning legislation. And that law made it compulsory for 
captions to be available from 6 a.m. to 12 midnight. But there's no reference to Auslan interpreters or interpreters at all in that legislation. We were constantly bringing this to the federal government's attention. They said, use the captions. You have access via the captions. That's access to information. And the AMA activity, you know, when you were taking photographs of the broadcasters, not including the interpreter in picture, we cited these as examples and also captioning errors. For example, Kempsey, when the MP talked about Kempsey, they went to Kempsey, okay, two different places altogether, right? And we said, this is a, a real life example as to why we need Aussie interpreters on television. And that really helped our cause. That made the point clear, the in, captioning errors that could result in life-changing decisions. So they set up a number of advisory groups after this. I think about coronavirus, that came along. We we're involved in that through the Department of Social Services and their disability consultation group and how information could be best disseminated to the Australian population. And I said, are Aussie interpreters there during the broadcasts? We were also invited into a different group, the Department of Health, and they focused upon the vaccination and the rollout of the coronavirus vaccination in Australia. We again said, ensure that you have Aussie interpreters there, part of your communications approach. So the Department of Health, I said, why don't you employ three, three interpreters in the Department of Health, it'll be their job to work within the Department of Health in-house so they have access to the information from the get-go. Okay, you have that regular supply of interpreters providing that information. And now you see that happening. James Wife has been there on television during the coronavirus vaccination rollout information by the Department of Health. So that's one example of some advocacy we've done access to communication. Now, in terms of advisory groups, you may be familiar with the ACMA, the Australian Communications Media Authority, ACMA. They're responsible for the broadcasters, radio broadcasters, telecommunications, all types of communications in Australia. They regulate that space. And during the bushfires, I recall bringing to their attention, why is information not being made available in Auslan, why, why are there no captions for this information to be presented in English? They said when the bushfires were happening in this particular area, there were, for example, towers there and they turned the, the electricity towers off, power station, electricity power poles off to prevent further damage, okay? And loss of infrastructure. I understood that argument and that decision, but once they turned that off, people that didn't have access to then televisions, captions, how do they have access to the information? They didn't think through the consequences for us in terms of accessing information when we rely upon the power supply. So they're now trying to reconsider the decision to turn off the power supply and those electric poles. You know. So it's a lot of work that Deaf Australia has done reminding people, bring our issues to the fore. This goes on and on, sharing information, lobbying, sharing issues, advocating. What I see time and time again through my advocacy work is a lot of good work done, campaigns and putting the word out and, and criticising, but think about it from their point of view when we're doing this. And I'll give you a case in point. You look at Facebook. Deaf people go to Facebook often, okay, and they rely upon Facebook as their one of their main sources of news, but a lot of others don't. You know, people are maybe driving in their car, they can listen to the radio, that's free, okay? And that's not covered by the legislation. So I said to ACMA, we're at a disadvantage there. As that people we're penalized, we don't have access to information you know, via the radio broadcast when people are driving in their cars or in their homes listening to the radio. I hope that that open letter made them think twice about that. They've changed their thinking and their approach to legislation. I'm really pleased to see that Facebook also retracted, you know, re recalled and then made their changes. We wanna drive home the point to the Australian government.
that our communication needs are the same as everyone else's. They're as equal as important. We're pleased to see that recognized. At the systemic level, I can tell you change is not easy there. To affect change, it is so hard. Channel 7, Channel 9, and Channel 10, and the ABC as well as SBS, they all are doing good work sometimes and not good work other times, right? It's not 100% hit. It's hit and miss often. The ABC reliably does better work most of the time. If there's a minister saying that all five are there, sometimes only three channels or two channels or four broadcasters are there. Depends which ones are there at, the, at any one time. If it's a channel 10, they may be the only one there, okay? And then that footage is then used by the other broadcasters or networks. And there's no standards there for what must, be, what must be shown, okay, in terms of on the picture, the minister, the government official, and the Auslan interpreter, the deaf interpreter, the access to information in Auslan. So we're showing best practice. We want one third, for example, available for the Auslan presenter or interpreter. And some don't want that and they're arguing. They don't want one third of the, the, the real estate on the screen. So there's lots of different you know, approaches and who's responsible you know, to, to share this information with the, the people on the ground, the camera, the camera crew. We need to improve that information dissemination there. So a lot of our lobbying is at the highest level, the federal government, national level. Now, please saying understand the information we're receiving, we're taking that on board. I, when we're hearing you, I get it. I see you. I understand the issues. I'm sharing this. Okay, with the highest levels of government in Australia. And we're taking a structural approach, okay? This is a human rights issue. It's your right to receive this information in your preferred language, in access to information and communications. And we take that responsibility seriously and we're continually reminding the federal government of that. So this is systemic advocacy. It's not easy. It's not an easy job. I enjoy it. It's challenging, but I do think then the short to medium term, we need to become more aware and understand how our approach to things can yield different results. And when we work together in a systemic way, we're a much more stronger, powerful voice. So we want to thank the deaf community of Australia for their ongoing support. Back to you. Oh, that was brilliant. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much. I mean, listening and watching what you had to say was absolutely excellent. <clears throat> so now we're going to have um, a session where you could perhaps answer some questions. So there are some questions coming through. Why does systemic advocacy, why is it so important at the national level? So that's one question that's come through, Kyle. Okay, well, systemic advocacy it's usually, okay, put forward a claim on behalf of the community. We put forward proposals on behalf of the community. We also know how government works, okay, government speak. So it's an issue that we identify with the federal government. We use the human rights view as our framework. Human, we take a human rights view. We look through things at a, via a human rights lens, okay? Access to information, access to communication. So we leave the emotion out, okay? We don't become, um, we don't vent, we don't become vindictive. We speak in purely facts and human rights frameworks. I used the information uh, yesterday presented in a meeting about vaccination and, you know, the phase one and one B group, okay? Uh, and I think the end of March will be available there. And I said in a particular forum yesterday, do we have the information available there in Auslan? I want to make sure that it's available there. So information is always there in Auslan. So if people ask for it, I'm like, no, I want more information. They said it's there. I receive more information. Based upon that, I know the information will be available to the deaf community in Auslan. So a deaf person knows when and how they can ask uh, for that support, you know, when it comes to getting their COVID vaccination. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Advocacy. Really important. And are any other work in the um, advocacy field, systemic advocacy, what, what has worked and what hasn't worked? 
Okay, so this year, one of our major successes has been the census, you know, 2021, it's going to take place this year, right? Yep. Do you know, Deaf Australia started lobbying for this, having Auslan recognised in our census is one of the questions, back in 2007, okay? So it's taken from 2007, working with the Australian government, the relevant government departments, they refused to change the census question about language. It's a very tight the run ship to change a question okay impacts data okay and the question and the source and the results and the information census results from past past census survey questions and data so what language do you speak at home do you remember that question in the census so well what language do you speak can we change that question to what language do you use that was so hard. That raised concerns about migrants and what will their understanding be? You know, will they understand the question if it was asked, what language do you use at home? So they tested it in Albury, okay, in a small pilot there. And after many, many years of advocacy, it, the question was changed from what language do you, you speak to what language do you use? And using it as a prompt and then having Ozan there. And then we saw an increase, okay, from... 3% uh, Ozan users, and we believe that this will be uh, a, a more successful. Another was an epic fail. You know, captioning of movies in cinemas, open captioning, that's so hard because most of the films come into Australia from abroad, and who creates the movie and the file? It's so hard. So this is an international uh, law issue, and Australia has this barrier here. So the Australian federal government says we can control what happens inside this country domestically, but it's very hard outside of Australia. So Australian films, by law, have to have captions, okay? So that's a given. But internationally, it's a different story. It's a new, a different challenge. We've had so many roadblocks. Let me just Maybe. check if there's any final questions. There is one, actually. How does the deaf community um, receive information and feed that through to Deaf Australia? Some good news to share with you here. Uh, in Facebook, I'm taking lots of social media information, uh, glimpses, past. It's so hard to track the information. We received no government funding for this. So this year, we finally received funding to develop a CRM, Customer Relationship Management System. And that CRM will be able to assist us collect data, okay, photographs, issues, concerns. So you actually now have a CRM. And we'll be able to have that data stored and then we'll be able to use that data, track it, analyze it. And we hope to, that will improve our advocacy and lobbying efforts. That's wonderful news from Sherry. Yeah, very exciting. Thank you so much for your time, Carl. We really do appreciate you giving up your time to come here tonight. Thank you for having me tonight, Deaf Victoria. Wow. Oh, what an incredible discussion tonight. Absolutely. We've, um, you know, we've come such a long way. So many improvements to access, to information, to media. You know, there's still a, long, a lot of work more still to be done. Definitely. Still a long way to go. Our work is not yet finished. Absolutely. Your work's not finished yet either. The Deaf Australia's work's not finished yet. And neither has Shirley's and Julia's. There's a long way to go still. However, I mean, working here at Deaf Victoria and being a deaf person myself, when I really reflect on you know, the achievements and the opportunities within the organisation, within the um, deaf community, all around Australia, I'm so proud when I learn about the achievements and the, the work that happens in regard to our human rights getting the information that we really need to have, which is so important, any government information, whether it's local level, state level or federal level. That way we can make informed decisions as an Australian citizen, it's so important. So improvements are happening. I mean, you know, we've only just started and I'm very excited about the future and what, um, what else is in store. So I'll just go over to, or hand over to um, Sarah now to wrap up. 
So Thanks just a little hint, right, right, that if you'd like any advocacy support or any information, media accessibility or any other issues that you face, please send us an email at info at deafvictoria.org.au. And again, I really want to say we're so grateful for our partners and incredible guest speakers tonight and our panel too. So each and every one of you, that are watching tonight from home. Thank you for joining us. Deaf Victoria is established upon the foundation of our deaf community, and we are dedicated to working with hashtag nothing about us without us. So if you'd like more information, please do check our self-advocacy toolkit and workshops. Both of those are accessible on our website. Here we are, here's the hard copy. So if you'd like to receive information, updates about our work, you can get it through um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the internet. And please follow our e-news, that goes out on a monthly basis, so stay tuned there. We also are looking forward to having a group that comes together called the Peer Group. And uh, there'll be a lot of information that we'll be able to pass on about that, how you can be part of that peer advocacy group. So stay tuned. Have a lovely night. Look after yourselves, everybody. And we'll see you at the next advocacy forum. And that's going to be happening in April next month. Make sure you, um, you know, check all the different platforms that you use and we will send out the topics. We will also tell you who our guest speakers will be as well. So stay tuned and have a lovely night. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>